Drew has some great tips for us, uh, some simple yet effective techniques for improving the quality of the video that you have to produce on the fly with, with um, ambient surroundings and no tools, um, just get it done. And so this is, uh, this is Gorilla Video 101, <laughs> Drew Keller, and uh, I think you're really going to enjoy this. So we're going to try to go through and give you just some nuts and bolts, some really practical things that you can hopefully facilitate. As audio is key, but there are a whole slew of things that you might want to consider. When you're creating content, even if it's just somebody who's an expert in a subject matter and they're just going to be talking on camera, you need to begin to think about how you can augment the idea visually. Uh, it, most people get lost in the words. They're concentrating on the script. That's what they think of. Video is not radio. You really need to be thinking about how you're going to engage someone. The reason why is we get a tremendous amount of the information that we get every day visually. We get 90% of the information, the things that we learn, the things that we know through visual stimulus. And when we do eye tracking studies, when we look at things in terms of how people engage, particularly in a web environment, they spend a very small percentage, often less than 15% of the time, looking at the person. Because if it's just a talking head, they get bored, they start looking at controls, they start looking at the banner ads, all the text, everything else. You need to be providing stimulus that is more than just the words. Now, certainly, when we're storytelling, what we're trying to do is make certain that you're delivering a coherent story. We have all of these different ways that we tell stories, different voices, and the script is certainly part of it. It's often your foundation. It's something that gives you structure. But we have another narrative voice that we use, and that's our images. You need to think about how your image may augment the story, how it may complement it. Sometimes you're telling a narrative visually that doesn't go in lockstep with the script, but gives richer, deeper examination of it. The other voice you have is sound. You need to think very carefully about all the natural sound that's in an environment. It's a great way to tell a story. Think about the number of times you've maybe seen something on television or, or in a movie where you hear the sound of the ambulance before you actually see it. It foreshadows that something is going to happen. So the sound of the environment is a really rich part of that narrative. And then the last part is often music. So your job as a storyteller is to try to manage these four different voices that you have. And at times they coincide and at times they don't. And that's the fun part of storytelling. It's much more than just thinking of a script. But let's start with the idea of visual storytelling and how you might tell it. One of the things that almost everyone forgets is that the environment is a character in your story. Where you choose to do your interview, where you choose to shoot, is critical to the engagement. Um, putting somebody against a wall is not necessarily a good choice. It's going to frame where someone is, who they are, it gives them credibility, it gives additional information um, to your viewer. For example, any guesses where this guy is? He's a salesman. What's, it, what's he talking about? Anybody have any guesses? Uh, it's a good guess. He's definitely athletics. He's talking about action cameras. And I'm at a conference. You know, cameras you mount on helmets or handlebars like GoPros and, and, and those sorts of things. Now, I could have done this interview. We're at a trade show. I certainly could have done this interview against one of the white walls in the background. I mean, a lot of people are like, well, let's go someplace that's, that's, that's neutral. The advantage of shooting it in this environment is it gives him credibility. Oh, look at all the stuff that's in the background. Oh, he must be an expert. Oh, we know who he is. Oh, we see the context. Also, if you're in an environment like this, a conference, a, a trade show, something like that, they tend to be very high noise environments, which makes it sometimes difficult to hear them as clearly as you would like. And you, in essence, are motivating why that noise is there. People tend to cut you a little bit more slack if they understand why all that noise is there. But most importantly, we look at the background, we look at the environment, we go, oh, he must know what he's talking about based upon what's going on. You can also augment what's going on with abstract backgrounds. Uh, any guesses what these guys are talking about? Genetics. Exactly. They're talking about genetic medicine. And the idea is you can take something that's abstract, the work that they're doing, 
we're trying to give context to their research and what's going on with an abstract background rather than just a plain background. You need to be careful though that you don't give an impression that you don't intend. If you see this as a shot, what do you think of the quality of this presentation? It's empty. Yeah, it's pretty dreadful. And, and, and if you went there, if, if, if you went to go videotape your peer presenting at a conference, and this is the establishing shot, people are going to go, no one cares about the research. You may go in there and go, wow, this is terrific. Look how big this room is. This is really important. This is really cool. I want to get a sense of the scale of this room. That's your emotion at the time, and I understand that. But unfortunately, the message you send is no one cared. And so perhaps just moving the camera behind some heads in the foreground, having them in the background, would have given a sense of people there without all of the empty chairs. So you need to be careful of how you manage it. And don't be afraid to group everybody. Exactly Get right. Group together. The other thing we use when we shoot a lot is something called the rule of thirds. And the rule of thirds, actually, scientifically, we don't start looking in the middle of a frame. We tend to look at one of these corners. And so, if you leverage verticals or horizontal lines to give to leverage rules of thirds, it can help immensely. It can give your images more interest, something that's more compelling. We tend to shoot by just kind of dropping things in the middle of the frame. Really boring, it's not how we look at it. So if we take this shot and we just move it over and tilt up a little bit, leveraging the rule of thirds, we end up with an image that's far more interesting to look at. And the vertical mast of the ship and the horizontal line of the water helps us to create an image that is more compelling. And when we look at it, we actually move clockwise around the image. We tend to start at the bright part where the ship is and move up clockwise to the mountains and then down around. It's just naturally how someone will look at an image. It gives more information, basically of information that is revealed, that is unfolding out of that image. So we tend to like to leverage the rule of thirds in a lot of the ways we shoot. And it's really not all that difficult to do. All you have to think about is A, pick a subject, and B, where am I going to put it? That's not always as easy as it sounds. There have been times when I'm shooting at an environment like Las Vegas. All of these signs in front of you, you've got all this chaos of stuff in front of you. The audience also finds that environment really chaotic. So your goal is to pick something that the audience clearly knows you're going to identify, leverage the rule of thirds from there, and then work out so they can move out within the image from there. The rule of thirds isn't a hard and fast rule. I, I actually sometimes call it the starting point of thirds. You're there, you look at it and go, wow, this is boring, what can I do? You tend and you start moving something around in the frame and the rule of thirds, you go, that's okay, but you know, I think I'm going to tilt up a little bit more or move over a little bit more. What often happens is the part you're trying to emphasize is in the two thirds and the part you're not emphasizing as much is in the one third. For example, Think of the hideous vacation photos you've had to look at from friends, and it's a sunset of the water. And the water is in a horizontal line, and the clouds are great, and the water's just kind of dull. Well, if you tilt up and use the water line as the bottom third in those clouds, you're emphasizing the clouds. You may look up and go, that's interesting, but you know, I think I want it to be the rule of four-fifths. It's really a starting point for you to begin to create images that are more compelling and more interesting for how you drive through it. So, you also need to think about stabilizing your camera. You really, really, really need a tripod, particularly if you're going to zoom the, zoom the image. I always have a tripod with me in some form, shape, or fashion. Even a small pocket tripod can save you tremendous grief. Your audience gets fatigued trying to track something, particularly in a web environment, trying to track something within there. If the camera is moving, give it a reason to move. You're walking with them, you're in a car. But if someone's sitting behind a desk and the camera's moving, the audience is going to bail. They're not going to watch. They're not going to engage. They want a stable image to work from. There are all kinds of tripods out there. Really cost-effective ones you could buy at a um, variety store, you know, Fred Meyer or something like that. They're kind of like a, your favorite pan or knife in the kitchen or your baseball mitt. You need to find something you're going to use. You need to go to the store, pick them up. We measure them based upon the number of segments to a leg. Most consumer tripods have three sections you can release out. 
Um, professional tripods usually only have one or two sections. Uh, camping, you know, tripods you may take for hiking may have four sections. The more sections, the wobblier it is, but that's okay. Because I'll take a four section wobbly tripod that nobody's touching over no tripod at all. It's better to have something that you're going to use. A tripod in your closet really is of no use at all. A lot of the cameras that we use have image stabilization. They, they have this little gyroscope in there. They're designed to hold a shot briefly for about 10 seconds or so. You literally are going to start seeing someone breathing if they're, doing, if, 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 if they're trying to use image stabilization. It doesn't work for things like interviews or those sorts of things. So go to the store, pick them out, take a look at them. This is a really big professional tripod that I use. And the, the reason why we use big heavy tripods is mass equals stability. The heavier, bigger it is, the lower the center of gravity, the less it's going to move. A lot of tripods have this hook on the bottom and it's not for clothing. The idea is you can hang something from the bottom of it. I actually went to REI and got a collapsible canvas bucket and um, I carry it in my bag with me and I put irons in there, cookbooks, rocks, water, anything that's available to me to add mass to the tripod and then I don't have to carry this big heavy tripod around. I just put all the books back in the shelf or put the iron away. But the idea is to find something that's going to be heavy in there and add some mass and some weight to the bottom. It's really important that you think about how you're going to stabilize it. The last thing I want to say about, sorry Austin, the last thing I want to say about shooting is that you don't want to hold your camera out like this. It tends to wave and wobble and do all of those sorts of things. It's like any sort of physical or athletic sort of endeavor. You want to stand with your feet shoulder width apart. I tuck my elbows in and I hold the camera with both hands. If I can lean against something like a wall or a door jam, a parking meter, a telephone pole, I'm going to be able to actually create an even, even better shot. I may put my hands on the table in front of me to hold the camera. Anything I can do to create a more stable platform is, is going to significantly increase the engagement of your audience online, actually, of audience no matter where they watch it. So lighting. We've, we've talked about composition, we've talked about stabilizing the camera, now you want to make certain people can see your content. Lighting is a little bit of alchemy. When we light professionally, we tend to leverage something called three-point lighting. Usually the camera, if it's an interview, is slightly off axis. If it's somebody who's an expert, we tend to shoot directly into the camera. And then we use three lights. The main light is called the key light, and that accounts for the majority of the light on the front of their face, but that light creates shadows. So then we use something called a fill light. It's usually not as bright, and that fills in the eye sockets and the shadow under the nose and the chin and those sorts of things. And then we use a light in the back. It has a lot of different names, a rim light, a hair light, a back light, it kind of all kind of the same thing. And the idea is to put some light on the back of somebody so that they're not melting into the wall, to give them some definition, some depth to your image. My guess is most people in this community are not necessarily going to be dragging professional lights around. Uh, I think that's really unrealistic. But using that basic idea of having three lights, a principal light, a light to kind of fill in the shadows, and maybe a light to kind of give them some definition, you can use available resources that are in the environment. Um, the thing that creates the biggest problem for you most often is the window. People tend to go, oh, I know, I'll shoot, and they'll stand against the window, we'll have this great view behind them. The problem is that the camera can't handle how bright it is outside and that it's not very bright inside. Uh, that is a problem. So typically I'll use the window in some way, but I won't have it in my shot. I'll use it as a key light or I'll use it as a hair light. In this case, we've used it as a rim light. And then I use desk lights all the time. Articulated desk lamps are great. You can move them up and down. You can move them around. They'll have to be fairly close because they're not as bright. And then because they're sometimes harsh, one of my favorite things in my bag is parchment paper for baking. We, we use parchment paper for baking because you can put it in the oven and it doesn't catch fire. 
Well, if I put a piece of parchment paper, really cost effective, in front of that light, it's what we call diffusion, and it softens the light. And I'll often use wooden clothespins, the technical name for those are C47s. Um, I'll use, I'll use clothespins on it to help um, hold it in place, and then I get a light that's uh, far more flattering. And then I'll look around and find something, anything that I can use to fill. It might be a desk lamp, another table lamp, uh, uh, something that's on the floor. I'm going to look for a way, to, a way to kind of approximate that sort of found um, resources. So every time you walk into the room, you need to look. What do I have available? The one thing I will say is that overhead lighting will almost always create the most hideous video possible. Overhead lighting is designed so you can see a paper when you write on it. So what it does, it creates these horrible shadows in the eye, under the nose, the chin. Um, it, it, people look like they're in an interrogation. It's not very flattering. And so if you can, turn off the overhead lights. The fixture I use most often, either as a key light or as a fill, is the trusty articulated desk lamp. You can adjust the brightness by adjusting the distance to your subject. If the shadows look too harsh, you can bounce the light off the wall to soften the effect. Often you'll need more than one, so don't be shy. Wander the hall to see what you can borrow. <laughs> For lighting, I've used work lights from my garage, table lamps, and fluorescent lights, whatever's available. I have a few $10 lamps from uh, um, you know, the, the silver reflector lamps from the hardware store and LED lights. They don't get hot, they are daylight. And uh, uh, so in my bag, I have a couple of lights there. When I get stuck, if I need something, I can just pull out this light with an LED and I can solve a multitude of problems. But as I said, you really need to be careful of the window. You need to be careful of, of how it creates a silhouette. The biggest available light asset is also the biggest liability, the window. Most cameras will automatically adjust the exposure for the brightest thing in the frame. Shooting an interview against the window can result in a silhouette. Sunlight from a window can be used if you are careful. The light can be very harsh, so if there are blinds, adjust them to balance the sunlight with the other lights in the room. And that's just a Luxo lamp in front of him, uh, lighting him, and by reducing the light coming in from the window behind them, the camera automatically adjusts to make his face the brightest thing. Uh, it, it is um, just kind of understanding how your camera is going to treat light can really do tremendous things to help you uh, through that process. If I have a window available and, and I have no other lights, often rather than shooting with the person with their back to the window, I instead use the window as my key light. That's not direct sunlight. Direct sunlight is really harsh, but that's the ambient light coming in from a window and that can help immensely to create lighting that is far more interesting and something that you can work with in that environment. This is an example of how not to do things. This is somebody talking about a product, but the camera has adjusted for the brightest thing in the background. It's handheld. You can't see him. You can't hear him. You have no idea what he's talking about. And that's really common with the content that I see. And the viewfinders in many of these cameras make the image look a little better in the viewfinder than it is in reality. And so you need to work with the camera enough to know if it's giving you a false positive. Two last things here real quick. One is audio. There are a lot of different types of microphones. It's really confusing. Um, you're really likely only to use one of two types of microphones. Either an omnidirectional microphone, that's on what's most, most cameras, or a directional microphone, a shotgun, that's the kind of microphone that we're using here today. If you're shooting your video with something small, like a pocket camera, or even your mobile phone, and you want to capture audio that your audience can hear and understand, but all you have is the microphone that's on the device, then you need to be close to the sound source. Really close. Okay, this is probably too close. If I need to rely on this microphone or the one that's in my camera, there are two things I always try to bear in mind. One, I try not to be in too noisy of an environment. Two, I try not to shoot further than arm's length away from the person I'm interviewing. That way the camera's microphone will do a good job of picking up the sound. Nothing gets in the way of your video like bad audio. If your audience has to work to hear what's being said, they're going to leave. So if you're shooting a story where audio is critical to understanding your story, you might want to think about using an external microphone. What should you look for? Well, first, 
make certain your camera has an external audio input. For example, this one does, this one doesn't. For interviews and presentations, choose a lavalier. A lavalier microphone is a small microphone that clips onto clothing. Because it's a better quality mic and close to the sound source, your audio is going to sound better. They range in price from $20 to $200, and even a cheap one is going to sound better than the microphone that's on your camera. There are a lot of options out there in terms of improving your audio, but your, the abandonment rates for videos with bad audio is unbelievable. Um, 10 seconds is absolutely right, but you have 0.4 seconds when they're going to decide whether they're going to watch it or not. And if they have to work to hear the audio, it's like, I'm going to go find something else. There's so many options, there's so much content up there. Currently on YouTube, we're, uh, they're posting 144,000 hours of content every day. So there's likely something that touches on your topic that has good audio. So they're not going to stay if, if, if your audio is bad. And you have to listen to the audio. Headphones are better, over-the-ear headphones. If you have earbuds, uh, it's okay, but they're designed to have sound link-in so you don't get hit by a bus. That's why over-the-ear headphones are much better, but you really need to, uh, re really need to uh, listen. And the last thing I want to talk about here real quick is framing your shot for your interview. There's a psychology to how someone is seen in the frame. We tend to use extreme wide shots as a way to establish a venue rather than someone else. If you have an interview with someone this far away, they're paying attention to the environment rather than the wide shot. Even a somewhat of a wide shot, the closer we get to the subject, the more we're emphasizing the person rather than the environment they're in. Medium wide shot, this is sometimes called a cowboy because you can see them draw their guns in the old westerns. We're still seeing the environment, but more and more we're paying attention to the subject in her environment. Most interviews are shot with a medium shot, a head and shoulder shot. This is neutral, this is where people are giving information. The medium close-up, this is where someone is really giving you the grist of what they have to say. It's the main reason why you do the interview. You really are paying attention to who they are and what they talk about. If you go closer than the medium close-up, if you go to an extreme close-up, basically folks need to be crying. They need to be really emotional. That's when, like documentaries, they zoom in and they go in really tight. There's also a psychology to camera angle. When you look up at someone, it makes them larger than life. It's like a judge or a statue or something that is, that is, that is really big. When we shoot even slightly below their eye line, we often see them as being more credible or someone to pay attention to, someone you want, you want to uh, um, uh, uh, pay attention to. Slightly above eye line, 60 Minutes does this all the time to the people you don't trust. You're looking down on them. It's not somebody who, who you have a lot of credibility. And this angle is the angle our parents shot all of our photos as kids, which is why they tend to be so diminished. Um, there's a real psychology to how we judge someone standing in the world based upon the, the elevation of the camera. 95% of the stuff you shoot is going to be neutral. It's going to be even with their eyes. As I said, there are no rules. I actually like the slightly above angle because it's often more flattering. It gets rid of chins and bags under the eyes. So there are times when I'll, I'll move up slightly just because they look better. And, and, and that's totally fine. You need to make certain that your, the environment, the background you've chosen in your environment advances your narrative. Um, this is really problematic. First of all, we've got part of a word for launch. If you're going to use a whiteboard, either erase it or don't. A uh, partially erased whiteboard is really a problem. I have no idea. In the corner, there's a totem pole, a duck, and a viking. And frankly, this big phallus in the background is really distracting. I didn't see that until you mentioned it. It's a rocket ship, isn't it? Yeah, it is. But it, it is. It's not helpful to this woman who agreed to do the interview. She's on this white wall. They're using available lighting, and you've got this really distracting background. It may make sense to you, and it may have a lot of inside jokes, but to your audience, they're trying to figure out what you mean, and they're not listening to what's going on. So choose your background really carefully. Location where videos go to die. Any guesses? The conference room. 
They are soulless places which suck the life out of your video. We often schedule them because you can get in there. They do not advance the narrative. Do everything you can to shoot in some place that tells your story. If you're working with a research scientist, shoot in the lab. If you're working with, with a, a, a professor, shoot in their office. If you're working with a team, shoot in their work environment. Give me a sense of who they are, what they're doing. Conference rooms do not tell us anything other than the lowest bidder of the paint supplier. So you also need to avoid shooting on white backgrounds. They do not look like an Apple ad. They're extremely hard to light. People tend to be too close. You just keep waiting for them to hold up the newspaper like a hostage. Do not shoot against a white environment it, unless you're in a studio with limbo. Try to find something that advances the narrative. It is just not an appealing or flattering place to shoot. Framing your shot is not difficult. Think of this rectangle as your canvas. And just like an artist, you want to be thoughtful about how you use every square inch of that canvas. You're going to use this frame differently depending upon your intended message. For example, if you're trying to teach someone something or you want to talk directly to them, that means you'll be centered up in the frame looking right at the camera. For example, a web camera. Well, I guess a video blog is about me. Or podcast. And welcome to episode 13 of the APB podcast. Watch the HD version because not only is the picture better, and the content on the internet is the brine. <laughs> or do it yourself show. We're going to go ahead and cook off our spaghetti. We're going to pull in and back out. Your tree will be healthy and strong. But if you're interviewing someone, you're going to use the camera a little bit differently. The camera is now an observer. Think third person. And you're going to give the subject of your interview a little bit more room, something called look room. That means we're going to give more space in the front of their face and less room in the back of their head. And because the camera is an observer, you're going to shoot the interview at a slight angle. It, it feels a little more natural as an observer. The area up here, well, this is called headroom, and you don't want too much of it. Finally, you want to make certain that you fill the entire frame of the interview. But you don't want to be too close because it can be a little scary. And if you're too far away, your viewers won't know where to look. So frame your shot with a nice head and shoulders. And remember, fill the frame. If you're doing an interview, give yourself a little bit of look room. If you think of your frame as a canvas, you'll do great. Last bit, because we're seeing more and more stuff acquired in mobile. What's wrong with this shot? Don't say it's a string band. Pardon what? Vertical video. We're having more and more content that's coming in leveraging vertical phone based video. Oddly enough, when we try to leverage it, this is what it looks like. The only choice we have is to either tell everybody to tip their monitor sideways or to do vignetting or pillar boxing. You need to turn the camera the same aspect ratio as the screens that we view. You've got to stop vertical video. Yeah, so Drew, we always ask our, our panelists to give us uh, two or three great tips. Drew always comes up with about 19. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but but really great stuff. So thank you very much for that. And I hope you all go forth and create more video. Hope to see you back. Good job.